All right, good morning. Well, I'll introduce myself, uh, Peter Ekman, uh, heart failure cardiologist here with Minneapolis Heart Institute. Thanks for joining us this morning. And I uh, realized late last week that I was foolish enough to agree to do this after daylight savings. So thank you everyone who came so early. Um, I have a lot of disclosures and several are actually pertinent to this talk. Um, even though this is a devices talk, I'm not gonna talk about LVADs at all, but I, we have uh, support from Alleviant for a trial. I don't get any money personally for this, and Cora. Um, I'm on the eligibility committee for this trial. Um, CVRX uh, have done consulting literally once, uh, helping start a program that hasn't done this yet. And then Edwards uh, provides us support for a trial as well. So obviously grateful for these relationships. And I will call these out as we come along. So I'm gonna cover four things today. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about atrial shunts. Second, I'm gonna talk about LV remodeling. Uh, third is baroreceptor activation therapy. And then very briefly, preload reduction and cardiogenic shock. And I'm also um, quick to point out that this is something that um, a lot of uh, members of our uh, practice and, and the heart failure section are involved in this. Um, and so I'm grateful for the chance to talk about this today, but it is by no means all stuff that I've been uh, leading. So uh, this is kind of an interesting story. Um, there was uh, this entity recognized called Ludenbacher syndrome many years ago. Uh, people, you know, when people have HEFPEF, they get effort intolerance and usually get a brisk increase in their left atrial pressure. Um, so that brings us to Dr. Ludenbacher. And it was discovered that people with mitral stenosis and a secundum ASD actually had a better prognosis. The idea there being you have high pressure in the left atrium, but that ASD works as a pop-off valve. And so this has led to a concept that intraatrial shunting might be helpful. And this is, uh, I fortunately was just at the THC conference last week, and so I have this whole wealth of slides that I got to uh, pick and choose from, but I'll do my best to cite where I got them. This is from Bill Abraham from The Ohio State University, sort of highlighting some of the background on this, that uh, closures of patients in unrecognized LV dysfunction, they get increased uh, left atrial pressure and pulmonary edema, suggesting that you know, having that shunt there is of some benefit. Um, Preclinical animal studies uh, suggest benefits to this, and then first in human and clinical pilot EFS type studies um, seem to suggest that this is a safe thing to do and may be effective. Um, there are a lot of devices out there. This is a very crowded field right now. Um, Corvia uh, has uh, uh, presented the reduced LAP trial. V-Wave is uh, presenting their results at ACC here shortly. Um, the two that we are currently, at least in Minneapolis, involved with is the Edwards device, which I'll talk more about that one. And then Alleviant has, is a procedure. It's not an implant. Um, but there's, needless to say, there's some variability in terms of the size of the hole that's made, the way this is done, and where these devices are in their trials. So probably the biggest one that's been presented so far is the reduced LAP2 trial. This is with the Corvia device was a pivotal phase three trial, international, sham controlled, uh, EF greater than 40%. Um, they had to have preserved RV function and the inclusion criteria were exercise right heart cath with a peak wedge greater than 25 and they had to have a gradient of at least five. So if your right atrial pressure is 22 and your wedge pressure is 25, that's not good enough because otherwise there's not a gradient and it wouldn't expect any decrease in the left atrial pressure. Uh, primary Outcome was a win ratio, CV death, non-fatal stroke, heart failure events, and KCCQ, which is a quality of life questionnaire that's widely validated and, and used in heart failure. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, over 300 patients randomized to shunt versus sham. It was a neutral trial, um, but as you can imagine, that doesn't mean we're uh, ready to give up on it. There's been a lot of work and a lot of people looking at this retrospectively, and there was a post hoc but pre-specified analysis looked at about half the patients um, had a peak exercise pulmonary vascular resistance of less than 1.7 and who did not have a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And that group seemed to do quite well and had a very favorable win ratio. And so uh, when you look at it in terms of who has responded or not responded, it sure looks like this has potential. Um, if th there's a, but at the same time, there's a group of patients that this type of technology might be harmful. And so this is still a new enough thing for us to do that there's a lot of interest in how can we tease out who's going to do well with this and who should we stay away from it. This is a presentation from uh, Dr. Kay, who's an echocardiographer from the Alfred and uh, 
Australia presented on impact on echocardiography findings in patients in this trial. And I thought this was interesting because it highlights, as you might expect, patients who get the shunt have an increase in right atrial and right ventricular volumes. Again, you've got high pressure on the left going across this shunt, um, more flow through the right. Uh, you also might predict that you would have less mitral regurgitation because you've got lower left atrial pressure, and you might have more tricuspid regurgitation. So it does shift the balance a little bit of where what's regurgitating. Um, there was not uh, an impact on RV function, uh, but there were decreases in left ventricular and left atrial volumes. Again, this all kind of fits with... Um, it's doing what we think it does. Uh, again, we don't haven't quite figured out who are the right people to put this in. And so uh, in a, this retrospective analysis of looking at who has benefited from this, um, in the, you know, there's some differences, as you might expect, between the responders and the non-responders. And so the non-responders appear to have had a, a much more of an increase in right atrial pressure, um, have had much bigger increases in their RV and diastolic and end systolic pressures, and their right ventricle got bigger. And so these are people that, that appear to have some amount of latent pulmonary vascular disease or their right ventricle function is poor enough that it's not handling this. So a lot of what people are interested in is how can we figure out whose right ventricle is not going to tolerate this. Um, these are, again, a couple of slides from uh, Sanjeev Shah, who had uh, previously spoken at this meeting um, at our virtual lecture a couple years ago, and presented on some of the echo findings of what you might expect and who you might look to avoid. He had been the international PI of this trial. You would expect the left ventricle and the left atrium to get smaller. So if someone has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if they already have a small LV, that's probably not a good setting. If they have a low output state, again, not a good setting. Um, and people that have a vulnerable RV, RV failure or right atrial failure, severe enlargement, these are people that you should be worried about. And people that have already moderate or bigger uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and, you know, the concept of this is the blood needs to get back to the left heart. So if you are putting the right ventricle under more strain, um, you're going to have problems. And so conceptually, uh, as we think about this, it sort of makes sense of why this population may not have benefited as much. And so, you know, the kind of people that you want to be looking at or looking for in this concept are folks that have uh, enlarged left atrium. Maybe the septum is bowing left to right. Uh, the left atrium is bigger than the right atrium. I mean, this is kind of mechanistically, when you're reading echoes, this is the sort of thing to look at to say, uh, hey, might this be a good candidate? The other thing you can look for is mid-systolic RVOT notching. That's a sign of pulmonary vascular disease and high PVR. Again, this is one marker. I'm certainly not going to spend a ton of time on how to read echoes and, and interpret uh, RV failure on an echo. But these are some of the things that you might think of um, uh, when, when doing this. And I, uh, some of you may have been at this talk from uh, Ultramics recently, and uh, uh, Dr. Hamid has been working with them on uh, sort of AI-based uh, methods to can we predict based on echo findings who is likely to respond from these devices. And so we think that it may be easier or, or look at screening echoes may be a way for us to kind of figure out this is the phenotype of patient that's going to do well with this. Can we identify those based on an echo? In part because doing exercise right heart cast is somewhat cumbersome and, and not everyone's willing to do those. So I want to talk a little bit now about a device that we have. This is a trial we are participating in. What's, there's a few things that are unique about this. Um, this is the one that's not an implant. Uh, this is a, a device that's fairly simple. It's a left uh, you know, transeptal puncture. Uh, there's a little tissue anchor, and then there's an electrode, and it basically uh, cauterizes a little hole and uh, creates a shunt. Um, this is an example of a, a early clinical trial or a... a preclinical trial, excuse me, that shows that the shunt is patent at 60 days, and you can see on H&E uh, &E that this is kind of uh, sealed off very well, uh, heals on endothelializes. So the preliminary data from this device, uh, a small series, early feasibility study, 32 patients, uh, most uh, were women, a mean age of 67, tended to have a higher BMI. Very high technical success, and the size of this atrial uh, shunt was 7.1 millimeters. Uh, they did not observe any CV adverse events, but there were 10 serious adverse events uh, in six of the 32 patients. None were felt to be due to the procedure. 
Um, and some were things like somebody died of COVID, somebody died of breast cancer, and as you might expect in a population of 32 patients, some get hospitalized for heart failure, which happened to three of them. So um, no real worrisome signals. Um, you can see in the upper right here that the uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, was decreased at, at both at rest and with peak exercise at a month. Uh, 5.7 millimeters decrease at a month. Um, again, pretty modest effect, um, but does appear to be doing what we think it does. There's a number of other signals from this early feasibility study suggesting benefit. NT pro BMP decreases, NYHA functional class. Uh, the cluster, you can see most are, uh, you know, functional class uh, three or four at baseline, and by three months, uh, we're now down to uh, quite a few more that have a better functional class. Six minute walk increases over time as much as 105 meters, which is really pretty dramatic. We see a 50 meter increase in things like biventricular pacing, which is pretty well established. And then the KCCQ score goes up quite a bit as well. And so this is a trial um, that is open and we are um, enrolling. It's targeting between 400 and 700 patients. Primary endpoint is time to CV mortality, heart failure events, and then uh, quality of life. Um, this is for preserved EF patients greater than 40%. Um, I think most are likely to be class three. Um, if they're ambulatory class four, that's an option. If they're class two, they have to have had a hospitalization. And as you might expect, they have to have an elevated wedge pressure during exercise. They have to have an exercise pulmonary vascular resistance that is low. Again, this is taking the results of the, the, uh, revi or the um, reduced LAP2 trial and saying, look, we've learned that people that have a high exercise-induced pulmonary vascular resistance don't do well. Let's not enroll those patients. So really trying to hone in on who do we think is going to benefit. Um, patients uh, can't have a pacemaker, and they can't have any evidence of right heart dysfunction, which um, I won't go into the details of all the protocol based, uh, you know, how we assess that. Um, another device that we uh, have been uh, working with for a while is uh, called Apture. This is made by Edwards. This is uh, moved from the early feasibility trial to uh, now in a, a pivotal trial. Um, this is a device that uh, is not between the atria, but it goes in the coronary sinus, which wraps around and is adjacent to the left atrium. So left atrium to coronary sinus, which coronary sinus dumps into the right atrium, it's effectively a left atrial to right atrial shunt, but the anatomy of it is a little different. One of the reasons that this was initially uh, invented, as I understand it, was uh, decrease the risk of stroke because you've got a lot tougher path for any clots to traverse. Um, but what has also come up is a question of whether the anatomy of this shunt uh, makes a difference and whether, uh, and we're, uh, the core lab for a sub-study with uh, Dr. Cavalcante to some degree looking at how does this effect flow through into the right atrium and subsequently the right ventricle and might the somewhat more physiologic flow through the coronary sinus uh, decrease the risk of RV failure. And so physiologically, this might be a different approach. It's anatomically different. It's a little, oh, I shouldn't say a little. I don't put any of these in. Uh, but it's a lot tougher than just doing a transeptal puncture, for example. Um, and so th this may have some disadvantages, but there also are some potential advantages to this. And again, both the Alleviant trial and this subsequent trial called Altflow 2 are trials that we are participating in. So this trial is similar. Uh, it's a multi-center, single-arm study. Uh, people have to have a functional class 2 to 4 heart failure, but have to have either had a heart failure event requiring IV Lasix, have an elevated BNP, um, and their hemodynamic criteria are a little different. Uh, wedge pressure greater than 15 at rest. Uh, left has to be greater than the right by 5 millimeters of mercury, um, or you have to have a wedge greater than 25 on supine bike exercise, and, and your grading has to be more than 10. And if you have a resting PVR greater than 5, again, looking for pulmonary hypertension, uh, are excluded. Can't have uh, bivy pacing. Uh, needless to say that there's only so much real estate in the coronary sinus. Um, and so, and if that's planned, this is also not a good device to be looking at. And people that are, um, actually both trials uh, exclude patients with restrictive myopathies, which um, we've actually had some discussions with the company about trying to have almost like an amyloid subset because that's a population you might expect would disproportionately benefit from this, um, but so far we haven't been able to get traction. Um, so I'm now I'm excited that I can present some of the uh, 
one-year analysis from the early feasibility trial. The six-month data has previously been published, but this was presented just last Tuesday, and so this is a, almost as hot off the press as it comes. So in the early feasibility trial, 239 were screened, 116 were enrolled, um, 11 had an implant aborted, and I will say that over time, some of the equipment and the techniques for doing the implant have, have evolved. This has been an early feasibility study, so this was not design-locked equipment. And so I you know, was at some investigator meetings, and they, you know, I sort of tuned out, but all the interventionalists nerded out about how we can change the catheter shape and size and make this easier. And so it has improved, and so although the abort rate um, is not insignificant, that has changed and has improved substantially over time. Um, of the 105 patients that had the device implanted, 10 had a low EF, and so we're excluding those for the purpose of this analysis because the main thrust of this is patients with preserved EF. And so, as you can see at the bottom, not all of the patients have had completed their one-year follow-up, but uh, 73 of them have. Uh, but, you know, four have died, two withdrew, one missed a visit, uh, but 15 are kind of uh, pending. Um, this device had very good safety outcomes. Um, the uh, <clears throat> number of adverse events, there were a small fraction that needed uh, re-intervention. Uh, there was one with surgical retrieval, uh, and a second with a post-surgical stroke. Uh, one had a surgical intervention for coronary sinus repair, and another had tamponade from perforation of the coronary sinus. So as with anything, we're putting wires in holes and things, there's always a chance the hole goes not where you want it. Uh, but in 95% of the patients, and again, a lot of these failures technically were early. Um, they were all patent at a year. Um, in terms of who was in this trial, I'm not going to go through all of these, but it's uh, roughly as you would expect, an average age of 70, BMI of 33, a high fraction of hypertension, AFib, COPD. Um, there were actually were a few that had biventricular pacing, and so that's a have to admit, I'm not sure how those snuck in there or if that was done after the shunt was put in. Um, at any rate, 93% uh, were NYHA functional class 3. Um, preserved EF, at least in this cohort, um, but evidence that the RV function was pretty good, at least by TAPSI of 20, um, RV fractional area change of almost 50%. Um, and so when we look at the outcomes, you can see Again, at baseline, 92% were NMHA functional class 3. By six months, that's down to 27%. And if you add up the functional class 1 and class 2, we're now seeing 70% of the patients are functional class 1 or 2 at six months. Um, and this was preserved out to a year. So this appears to have been effective and persistently effective, at least for a year. And we also see uh, substantial improvements in KCCQ overall health status that, again, uh, by six months, we're seeing this benefit, and it seems to persist at a year. Now, there, this uh, study has had core lab data to perform a hemodynamic analysis, um, and this was not intended uh, initially in terms of that, you know, there, there weren't, we've, we've enrolled enough with high PVR, we're going to stop. These are patients that, you know, when this early feasibility was ongoing, we didn't have as much data from the reduced LAP2 trial, and so enrolled a broader population of people with pulmonary vascular disease. So there were 24 patients that had resting uh, PVR greater than 2. And as you might expect, they had a higher PA systolic pressure of almost 60 compared to 40. Their mean PA pressure was 10 points higher, and their PVR was on average 3 in contrast to the 1.8 in the whole uh, group. With exercise, um, both groups had an increase in wedge from about 20 to 35. Um, the high PVR group had a trend towards increase in right atrial pressure, and there was a significant increase in PA systolic pressure suggesting that this does cause more strain on the RV if you've got high uh, PVR. Um, now, what did we find? Uh, we saw that uh, and the, one of the outcome measures was change in wedge pressure at 20 watts of exercise. And so when you look at from baseline to three months, these are violin plots here, um, that's the group of patients that had three-month data, and then you may notice the baseline to six months, it's a slightly different number, and that's because not all of those same patients had three-month and six-month, and so they're designed so that you can do pairwise comparisons. But you can see that uh, by three months, the wedge pressure at 20 watts of exercise was on average five millimeters of mercury lower, and at a six months, it was 5.7 millimeters lower. There was not a one-year um, uh, exercise right heart cath, uh, and so that's why this data stops here. 
What's notable when you look at subgroup analysis, though, is that there really do not appear to be any signals, or they're certainly not as strong in this group, which it's a smaller trial than a reduced LEP. Uh, but the patients with resting PVR, um, you know, still cross the midline pretty easily. And uh, so this device, there's at least some suggestion that the, the sensitivity to the pulmonary vascular disease may be not as prominent. Um, also, I think you'll appreciate on the KCCQ score uh, analysis, that, you know, changes of 25 points persistent uh, six months and out to a year. This is a really big improvement in, in quality of life. Uh, score changes of 25 are, are really dramatic. Um, and so this early feasibility data suggests that people who had chronic symptomatic HFPEF and elevated wedge at rest and or with exercise had a high success rate uh, with low rates of uh, problems, uh, meaningful improvements in symptoms and health status at a year. Uh, the improvements in their wedge pressure uh, were notable and persistent. Uh, and we really did not see uh, you know, differences in terms of the subgroups of who benefited or did not benefit in this trial. And uh, we did not see evidence of impact on RV volume, hemodynamics function, or RVPA coupling. Again, it's a smaller trial. It's not sham controlled. Um, so I think you know, this is preliminary in the sense that it's from an early feasibility population. But what I found really encouraging about this was when the reduced LAP2 trial came out, um, it really, I think, put a bit of a damper on enthusiasm in this field in that this was a big sham controlled trial and it was essentially a neutral trial. And yet, I think there's still a lot of interest in this space. And as you saw, there's still a lot of devices that are being tested here. Part of it is HEFPEF remains a major challenge. And we have you know, data now from the STEP HEFPEF trial looking at use of GLP-1 receptor agonists in this population. Um, but I think it's an area that still merits some ongoing work. And so it's, it's an exciting space. You know, I think we should be proud that we're a part of it and have um, access to these technologies. Um, in terms of these trials, you know, I'll be honest, part of why I'm here today is just to make you aware of what's happening in the space, but also um, help uh, make people aware that these trials exist and that we're looking for patients that might be uh, suitable. Um, there's some differences. Patients for the ALAY trial, that's the one where we just burn a hole, um, can't have any pacemaker at all. Uh, alt flow, if they're in the RV, it's okay, but they can't have any in the coronary sinus. The PVR exclusions are a little different. Um, LA is totally covered, whereas alt flow is CMS approved, but private payers won't pay for it because it's a randomized trial. So um, alt flow will be a Medicare population, basically. Um, the LA has a screening right heart cath. Alt flow does one at six months. Um, LA requires a diuretic. Alt flow does not, but if you're on one, the dose has to be stable for about a month. And then there are some subtle differences in terms of the resting right heart cath requirements and the exercise requirements, but I don't want to bog you down with all those details. Um, so would ask people to at least consider this if you're seeing patients with uh, HEFPEF that are persistently symptomatic. Um, independent of this, I think we probably underutilize right heart catheterizations to really understand people's hemodynamics and where we might target their therapy. This is also going to help us figure out who shouldn't do this and, and which patients that we shouldn't even be thinking about this. Um, you know, one of the uh, strategies that some other centers have employed is if they have a patient that has, a, you know, right heart, or not right heart, a coronary angiogram for suspected coronary disease, and the coronaries uh, look good, but their LVEDP is elevated, you know, that's another way that we may be able to identify some of these patients from another pathway. And uh, Emil and I were talking about that at our heart failure structural uh, meeting here a couple weeks ago, um, that that's something that we probably also could be better about doing more consistently. The other thing is when you're looking at echoes, you know, think about those patients that have a large left atrium and a smaller right atrium. This is the phenotype of patient that we think might benefit from this type of a device. I'm going to take a sip of water and then we'll shift to talk a little bit about LV remodeling. So this is something that's been of, of great interest to the heart failure community for quite a while. This is part of how these drugs work. So for example, enalapril uh, decreases end systolic volume uh, from the consensus trial by 13, a carvedilol by 32 milliliters, CRT by 25 milliliters, a mitral repair and replacement decrease at mitral clip doesn't really have much benefit. 
or, or, or on this, you know, end-systolic volume. So a lot of other heart failure therapies do lead to reverse remodeling, which is felt to be a, a critical goal. There's a couple of technologies that are trying to do this, and some have been around for a while. This is a Carillon device. This was presented by um, Samir Kapadia, who's leading this trial through Cleveland Clinic. This is a device that has a couple of anchors in the great cardiac vein and uh, coronary sinus, um, described as relatively easy to put in. And once it's in, it uh, kind of cinches up the heart a little bit. Um, unfortunately, this trial's only had 18 patients randomized so far, but they have had 80 consented. And so this is still relatively early in, uh, in the, the trial, um, but this is a, a competing technology that's out there. Um, another device that uh, we were in this trial briefly but didn't enroll anybody and, and uh, exited from the trial, which um, based on these results I think was turned out to have been a good decision. Um, this is looking for patients that have an LV aneurysm and have SCAR. And it's kind of a, a wild approach. <clears throat> it does seem to work. Um, that you can somewhat percutaneously and often with a hybrid approach, um, essentially the concept is plication of this area of scar where you put anchors through it, cinch those together, and then that scar basically gets excluded. And so you can sort of see the concept of it at the bottom. Um, it's hard to describe and it's hard to find great pictures of it. Um, but the ALIVE trial uh, results were presented uh, at THT as well by Jerry Estep um, and showed that it, that it was effective in terms of decreasing end systolic volume. Um, the control patients dropped by 12, um, probably suggesting that, you know, some degree of Hawthorne effect and participation in a trial, they were probably having their meds titrated more aggressively. Um, but patients that got the device had a decrease in their end systolic volume index of 27, which is a pretty striking improvement. So it appears to work in terms of you can reduce end systolic volume. The trial met its primary safety endpoint, <clears throat> although um, the upper bound was, uh, where is it, 40%. So they needed to have less than 40% of the patients have major adverse events, which that's not a real impressive bar in my opinion. Um, and when you look, out of the um, you know, patients that had problems, there were three deaths, 10 required placement of mechanical circulatory support devices, seven required emergency cardiac surgery, um, nine had prolonged mechanical ventilation, there weren't any you know, strokes, some degree of renal failure, um, but there was you know, the device sort of surgical only, 13%, and device with the hybrid RV-LV approach, 20%. And when you look at the composite efficacy endpoint, um, they did not meet their uh, hierarchical efficacy endpoint. And when you look here, the control uh, won 6% uh, better in terms of death, uh, lower risk of hospitalization. Uh, the device did win in terms of six minute walk uh, and uh, Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. Um, but I, I think this was, uh, you know, people were, were disappointed at this outcome that it you know, appears that it may have some efficacy, but it, you know, it's a little more complicated procedure and the, the um, uh, risk of adverse events was not significant. So I, you know, editorializing here, I suspect they will have trouble enrolling in subsequent trials. Um, now I want to talk about a device that we've been involved with since an early feasibility phase. This is uh, the AccuCinch made by Ancora. And again, I'm on the el eligibility committee for this trial. Um, so do have that conflict that I want to call out. And we, again, are participating in this trial. The concept of this is that it goes in the left ventricle and cinches up the ventricle. And I'm, I'm hoping I did test this that my video is going to play. Oh, good. <clears throat> and so I'm going to just let this video play. I'll do a little bit of annotation here. Um, and so this is retrograde across the aortic valve. You then put a wire in and then use this guide catheter. And this shows it almost right below the mitral valve. That's probably a little higher than it actually is. It's probably a little lower uh, relative to the mitral valve uh, than what you're seeing here, but um, you get the idea. <clears throat> Once the <clears throat> guide catheter is in place, you use these almost they're like little side ports that put out these uh, anchors. So part of the screening process, you have to have adequate LV thickness. If the LV is too small, they can't participate. <clears throat> we also had at least one patient that we did an MRI that had some scar tissue and it was, Paul told me it was a challenge to get the anchor in. Um, so that's something that, you know, is uh, 
anatomic screening is something to be very much aware of when uh, considering participation in this trial. But I think it's, a, it's kind of a neat concept uh, of how this is done, and I can't, unfortunately, I can't speed this up, so we'll have to watch it put in a couple more anchors here. This is faster than the actual procedure. While this is happening, um, I'm going to send around. We have a couple of little models that show, you know, pink is initial, blue is after the patient has had this uh, device cinched. I'll start one over here and one over here. They kind of give you a sense of how much of a decrease in the LV you can get with this. One of them's already broken, so don't feel, don't feel bad if you break it further. <clears throat> so once you have all these anchors in place, uh, and they, they have these you know little wires, uh, it's then possible to basically cinch it up. You can see the wires being pulled as the the guiding deployment catheter comes out, and then you push that along there and pull the wire, which then cinches the anchors, which it's going to show here in just a second. So the concept there is these anchors help cinch in the ventricle. So uh, again, relatively simple conceptually, um, does take some technical skill. Uh, this is some uh, data from uh, both uh, really a cadaver and preclinical uh, and patients that had been in the, some of the early feasibility trials that subsequently were either transplanted or uh, died. Um, you can see that the device integrates into the wall relatively uh, well. Um, these are some examples of the reverse remodeling that we see. There's immediate post-procedure decrease in the LV diameter. And uh, what's also interesting, and this slide doesn't show it as well, is that it appears that there's further remodeling beyond the initial index procedure. And so it's speculated that this um, may help trigger further biologic remodeling by reducing wall stress. So for example, at a month, we see a decrease of LV end isolic volume of 10 milliliters, but that continues out to a year, and at a year, um, seeing about 40 milliliter difference. Um, that suggests that there may be some uh, secondary biologic effect to this. This is obviously not well understood, uh, but this persistent or, or continued remodeling was a surprise. Um, the uh, KCCQ improvement of greater than five points is thought to be clinically significant, and as you'll recall from some of the shunt trials, have also been seeing quality of life improvements on the order of 20 to 25, uh, which is what we see here, and uh, clinically significant improvement in six-minute walk. Again, depending on who you ask, anywhere from 25 to 40 is thought to be significant. Um, almost 50 meters here, and again, this is comparable to what was seen with biventricular pacing. Um, this uh, device was well tolerated. Uh, there were quite a few heart failure hospitalizations, uh, one death and one uh, LVAD, um, which I think that might even be our patient because um, we had someone that got it for um, an, the initial version of this trial. They were also looking at it for functional mitral regurgitation and then pivoted to more of a heart failure indication. And so one of the early feasibility ones we had done was for someone with torrential inoperable MR who then subsequently got an LVAD, um, but had very good uh, composite uh, event rates, um, and we're participating in the CoreSense HF trials targeting 400 patients. We're up to about 130 randomized so far. Um, and so to be in this, you have to have an EF between 20 and 40 percent, either NYHA2 with a hospitalization in the last 12 months. Um, honestly, what I've found is the patients that are most open to this are folks that are NYHA functional class 3. If they're functional class 2, they're generally not feeling well enough that they want to be in an investigational trial. Um, they have to have a dilated ventricle greater than 5.5 centimeters, and they can't have significant MR. So really, it's people that ha are in that sweet spot of EF 20 to 40 percent, not you know terrible. It, what I'm seeing clinically is people that I think are potentially suitable are folks that have heart failure. They remain symptomatic, but they're not sick enough that we think a VAD or a transplant makes sense. Usually, we've already exhausted all the other stuff we can do with IV pacing and, and other uh, medical optimization. Um, and so this is a trial that uh, hoping uh, to complete enrollment in the next roughly year, uh, but is moving along pretty well. Again, eligibility guide. Patients have to be on a very good medical therapy and uh, have persistent symptoms, um, or if they've had a bi pacer and they have symptoms, or if they had MR and it gets fixed. Um, so this is uh, another device to consider. 
I'm going to pivot now and talk a little bit about baroreceptor activation therapy. Um, this is uh, a new technology that we have available here um, over the last, uh, just over six months. We did our first implant in July with Dr. Jeff Jim, who had been participating in some of the trials of this upstream before he came here. Um, you know, I, you've, many of you, most of you have heard me talk in other forums about the benefits of guideline-directed medical therapy and how essential that is. Um, it, and it is, but the improvements in exercise capacity are relatively modest compared to what we see with a device like CRT. And the, the concept of so much of what we do in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is blocking sympathetic activation. And so that's what all these classes of drugs are basically doing. And yet we haven't spent as much time, can we activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which should functionally have the same benefit. Mm -hmm. And so patients that have heart failure have decreased carotid sinus baroreceptor signaling. We, they obviously have elevated sympathetic tone. That's so much of what we've learned over the last 40 years of how to treat these patients. And these have a lot of adverse effects on the heart, the kidneys, and the uh, vascular system. So the concept of this is an implantable pulse generator and a carotid sinus lead. So it's put in, it's like a pacemaker. This is tunneled subcutaneously, and it is attached to the surface of the uh, carotid artery. This is not an intravascular procedure. Um, and so what that does is deliver electrical st stimulation to these carotid sinus baroreceptors, which send a signal to the brain, which increase parasympathetic output to the body and affect the heart. This is uh, now an almost 10-year-old trial that showed that baroreceptor, baroreceptor activation decreases sympathetic tone, so physiologically seems to achieve what we're, we're hoping it will do. Um, the trial that got this approved was the BDHF trial. These were functional class three, low EF patients. Um, they had to have high BNP or previous hospitalization, stable medical therapy. And if they were eligible for BIV pacing, they couldn't be in the trial. You had to have conventional treatment first. Um, uh, I'm going to just try and highlight a couple of factors in this. Um, systolic blood pressure, 120. Diastolic, 74. Um, BMI of 31, uh, preserved renal function for the most part, um, EF of around 30%, BNPs of about 700, uh, you know, a lot of coronary disease, um, good medical therapy. Um, you'll notice the absence of SGLT2 inhibitors. This trial was done before we sort of knew what those were. Um, this was a, an interesting pathway. It was a two-phase trial design. Um, and they were able to get a pre-market phase as a breakthrough device and based on six-month randomized data. And then there's post-market phase that is ongoing where they're looking at longer-term uh, outcomes. And so um, that may allow expansion of the label for the device, uh, but it's you know has been FDA approved since uh, 2019. And the label uh, was expanded a little bit last year. Um, this got approved in 2019, and then COVID happened. And so I think that's part of why this didn't get a lot of traction or people didn't hear much about it until um, that sort of faded a bit, at least from our nonstop, all-the-time consciousness. Um, the BDHF trial, um, again, enrolled about 500 patients. And there's really some interesting findings here. We saw increase in six-minute walk of almost 50 meters. Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Quality of Life score dropped by eight points. Again, with this metric, lower is better. And NYHA functional class, 32%. It was improved at a year. So appears to be effective from a sort of patient-centered approach of how far can they walk, how do they feel. Um, Longer-term outcomes have also suggested a 34% relative reduction in all-cause death, uh, VAD, or transplant, suggesting that this may... Uh, slow the progression of patients with this uh, disease. I, uh, when I'm discussing this with patients, it's not something that I'm saying this is going to help you live longer. This is more of a we hope that the intent of this is to help people feel better. Um, with more time, this may become more evident. Uh, but again, I don't think this is enough, at least in my mind, for us to uh, take the mortality claim. It was very safe uh, in this uh, trial. Uh, uh, one stroke, two infections requiring explant. Again, this is extravascular, which is kind of handy. In terms of the implant, this is relatively simple. Uh, Dr. Jim couldn't be here today, but he tells me it takes about an hour and a half of OR time. Um, it's done as an outpatient procedure. 
Um, small incision, electrodes put on the carotid artery, they tunnel to the pectoral pocket, put the device in, close it up, uh, very straightforward. Um, some centers are even doing this, uh, and we've talked about at some point this may be something we could potentially even do at the uh, ambulatory surgical center. Um, not at that point yet, but that's a possibility. Patients then come in every few weeks for up titration, where we increase the signal strength a little bit, and uh, what's generally been observed is that it does lead to some decrease in need for diuretics. Um, our experience to date, we've done four implants. We have another three approved and pending. Um, high, pay, they have to have a BNP less than 1,600. If they don't, then it's sort of off-label, and then it's extra hard to get payers to agree to this. Um, we've had, um, of these four implants and three approved, we've had at least 37 patients that we've referred who have sort of gone through the authorization process. So it so far has been a, a success rate in the order of about 10%. Um, we've had some more success with Medicare, and we have eight or nine that are Medicaid that we're sort of waiting for guidance uh, from Alina on how to proceed with that. So. Um, there's a lot of patients that are inter that have been interested in this that just can't get access to it. Um, it's being deemed investigational or experimental, which um, this is not a new problem within cardiovascular innovation, but the diff just because something is FDA approved does not mean that the payers think that it is uh, practice medicine. Um, this, this is a program that I've had a small part in. Um, Dr. Hagelin is the one who sort of really spearheaded this, and Dr. Jim, who had experience previously, um, have really been a huge part of this. And um, two of our heart failure nurses, Emily and Rueda, have really done a great job putting together a process and really spearheading this process. Um, have had a lot of support from others, and then Stephanie Garrison, who uh, helps us with uh, prior authorization support. Um, so this has taken a lot of work to get to the point of being able to do this, but um, it's uh, been noticed. We were lucky to get a little media attention recently, and um, just last week was uh, told that uh, uh, one of the physicians at M Health wanted to refer a patient for this because they don't have it at their center yet. So um, something that I think, again, we can be proud that we have this as an option for our heart failure patients. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly is a, a novel device that, again, one of our former uh, virtual lecturers, uh, Dr. Naveen Kapoor from Tufts, had talked about a device that he had been working on, which is designed to modulate preload in cardiogenic shock. Uh, started a company, uh, Precardia, that has subsequently been acquired by Abiumed, now Johnson & Johnson, and uh, an early feasibility trial of 10 sites. Uh, that we are now part of. Uh, Dr. David Miranda, who joined us recently, um, was a PI at St. Cloud, and the trial followed him here, so we were really lucky to get him on several levels. Um, but uh, this is a, a device that's designed to reduce preload by, um, it's a balloon that gets put in the SVC and is intermittently inflated. Um, and so this is an example of some uh, early uh, data suggesting you know, while it's inflated, the jugular venous pressure goes up to about 40, um, and it's for, you know, as long as five minutes. Um, we do see that the mean pulmonary artery pressure drops substantially. Mean systemic pressure doesn't change. Right atrial pressure drops, as you might expect, and then the wedge pressure drops substantially, too. So hemodynamically, this seems like uh, it, it's effective. Um, you know, this is a device that uh, there's current seven sites currently um, live, uh, we're part of the next six, uh, and again, uh, Dr. Miranda is going to be our uh, site PI, and we are literally having our site initiation visit tomorrow at 7 a.m., so this will be starting soon. This is targeting uh, patients with class 3 and 4 heart failure with inadequate diuresis, um, and they have to have uh, systolic heart failure um, if they have bad valve disease or acute coronary syndrome. These are not the patients to enroll. So um, at some point, Dr. Miranda uh, may be able to speak more to this trial but wanted to at least call your attention to it because I think it's a really novel, neat device, um, and we're part of a real select group of sites that are doing this. In fact, looking here, um, you know, many, if not most, of these are major academic centers, and so, again, I think we can be proud of the research infrastructure that we have here that allows us to participate in a really novel trial like this. Um, briefly, uh, to be in this, you have a period where you can escalate diuretics, and if it doesn't work, you get the device during the device, you can't escalate diuretics because one of the outcome measures is does it improve decongestion. So um, really a neat device that you'll probably hear more about and maybe even see in the wild. Uh, but I'll stop here. And, um, you know, there's 
20 other devices. Uh, the THT meeting, I know uh, Lisa and Pam were there as well, and uh, really a lot of neat stuff happening in the heart failure space these days. Um, you know, I could have done two slides on each of 20 other devices, but um, these are the ones that we sort of have already been invested in and participating in. Some are really bananas. There's one that's a device that basically causes localized diaphragmatic stimulation, and that little <coughs> wiggle is supposed to indent the LV and increase your LV, uh, <coughs> your stroke volume by about 10 milliliters. And I'm like, really? And But it looks like maybe it works. I don't know. There's another that's like a percutaneous pericardiotomy where you sort of put in a spear and then tear the pericardium, and that's supposed to help uh, all sorts of really novel ideas out there, um, not all of which are, uh, in my opinion, ready for uh, prime time to be discussed at Grand Rounds. Um, but really a neat meeting and a, a neat space that uh, heart failure has got so many neat innovations and a lot of people working in this space. It's not all about LVADs. Um, so I'll stop there. Be happy to take any questions. Um, but I uh, hope you found that interesting. Yes, Scott. Uh, that was worth the uh, losing an hour of sleep over. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a high compliment. <laughs> okay. um, it's worth losing sleep. When you look at the uh, hemodynamics of the atrial shunts and the, the uh, change in the pulmonary blood flow, what, what do you see and does that correlate with symptom relief? The, the, the question was, what do you see in terms of pulmonary blood flow changes? The QPQS in these trials has been pretty low, like 1.1, 1.2. So it's very modest. Um, and it has, it, to my understanding, has not correlated with symptom changes or you know, efficacy or failed efficacy yet. Um, but it, it seems like it's, you know, and that's one of the theories of some of these companies have devices that you can titrate your hole size where you could presumably start small if it doesn't work, make it bigger. Or if you have someone that you have pulmonary vascular disease or, or an RV that you don't think is going to tolerate it, you can start with a small shunt. Um, so I think that's an area we, we just don't know enough about yet. But the shunt fraction is pretty low. I mean, these are very modest changes. <clears throat> yes? You noticed for the, noted for the reduced LAP study that those with tricuspid regurgitation weren't good candidates. And I'm just curious, I recognize this is early days, but with the recent approval of Edwards um, Evoke, the tricuspid valve replacement, and then the anticipated approval of Triclip for tricuspid repair, if there's been any discussion of concomitant procedures could open this up to a greater, more patients or improve outcomes yeah, for the, these devices? Yeah, the, the question for folks online was whether, um, you know, the reduced LAP trial suggested patients with tricuspid regurgitation didn't do well, and there's all sorts of new technologies and devices and ways to address TR. Um, I haven't heard that discussed explicitly, but I think it's a, it's important for us to keep in mind that if we have patients with severe TR that we can make better um, that, you know, with some other technology, that may open them up to eligibility for this type of a device. I think a lot of it boils down to not just the severity of TR, but what's the RV function. And so if you've got some TR and you make that worse, then their RV is going to fail. But if they've got TR but a well-functioning RV and you can address that, that might be a population that would benefit from this as well. So I think, you know, it's an exciting time that we've got so many different technologies to treat all these different problems in the heart. Um, and, you know, tricuspid was even, well, not as much as the pulmonic valve. I mean, let's be honest, we largely ignore that one. But the tricuspid valve was pretty ignored up until very recently. Um, and so I think there's a lot we don't know. It's, it's an exciting time to be working in cardiology. Yes, John. Uh, yes, Dr. Ekman, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, we have one virtual question thus far. Uh, it comes from Dr. Cavalcante, who says, uh, great talk. wonder if you could elaborate on who would be the ideal patients to be considered for those heart failure device trials, specifically for obesity, HEFPEF, uh, should GLP-1 be already on board? Uh, great question. Um, are you, do you have a mic, too? Could people hear your Yes, yeah, so we've got okay. the room. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so, yes, if we can get people in GLP-1 receptor agonists first, I think that makes sense. Um, in practice, what we're running into, though, is at least so far, um, you know, the step hefpef trial did not enroll diabetics. And so we have data that HEFPEF and obesity without diabetes does really well with these uh, drugs. 
Um, in actual practice, if you prescribe one of these drugs for someone who has HFF and obesity but not diabetes, it will be denied 100 times out of 100 because they don't have diabetes. And so the, there's a, a step HFF diabetes arm that's going to be presented soon, which might help, but it's another one of these where the uh, payers in the regulatory environment, it's really more payers, I shouldn't call it regulatory, um, are an obstacle to this. And th these drugs are really expensive, and we're having a lot of trouble getting them uh, approved for patients. Um, and then there's some who can't tolerate it. So I think, yes, I, I'm trying to use these drugs as much as I can, uh, but we're running into a lot of obstacles. And so if you're thinking, you know, that'd be another candidate, is someone, if you think a GLP-1 receptor agonist would be effective, but you can't get it paid for for them, that would be another trigger to say, hey, maybe this is someone we look at a shunt trial, and then the payers will refuse to pay for that, too, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Buddha. Um, for the uh, barrow stem, I'm wondering if there's any issues either with safety or efficacy related to carotid artery disease. Um, uh, and then se second question is uh, with the SBC balloon device, um, I'm wondering what that triggers to and the balloon pumps we trigger to, you know, ECG or pressure. Yeah. What does it trigger to on the right? So two questions. First about barostem and carotid disease. They do have to have a carotid ultrasound to make sure they don't have critical carotid disease, but it's extravascular. So it's on the surface. Um, so that's something, you know, if they've got terrible carotid disease, we would potentially address that first. Um, we haven't had that come up where we've had someone with bad carotid disease, but at least in the trials, it doesn't seem like that's a major problem. Um, and then with the uh, SVC occlusion device, this is not rapid cycling like a balloon pump. This is inflate it and leave it for several minutes. So the timing, we don't need to ECG trigger it or pressure trigger it. It's put it up, reduce preload for a period of several minutes, and then you deflate it. <clears throat> Do you see uh, any opportunity with the... Uh parasympathetic stimulation, uh, is it physiologically feasible to do it non-invasively? I don't know. I mean, you know, how can you activate? I, well, I'm trying to think who was, I was talking to someone about this just the other day. It might have been Jaw, actually. So much about the autonomic nervous system we don't know. Um, I think we have far more patients that have autonomic neuropathy or some component of autonomic failure in their um, constellation of symptoms that we just don't diagnose it. We don't have tools to say, you've got parasympathetic overactivation or underactivation. And um, part of it is we haven't had ways to address that. You know, I think that's part of why, um, I, I think of the analogy, part of why the implantable pulmonary artery pressure sensor has been so embraced by the heart failure community is if you tell me that your PA pressures are up, I know what to do with that, and I have meds that affect that. Whereas if your implantable defibrillator tells me that your heart rate variability has gone down, I don't have a pill for that. Like, I might agree that, yeah, that's a sign that your heart's not great, but I don't have a way to affect it. And I think it's the same with the autonomic nervous system, where we just don't have good ways to diagnose and modulate it. And so <clears throat> I, I'm unaware of any devices that would do non-invasive stimulation of it, um, but I, I have to confess I don't know a lot about what are the things that activate your parasympathetic nervous system other than, you know, with my ring I've learned about deep breathing techniques, so that's one, but um, mm -hmm. things like that, so I, I don't know, I, that would be obviously appealing if you could do it without the invasive nature of it. Do you know of anything, Scott? Or you no, I was just <laughs> curious, it just seems like the barrier to widespread utilization would be that. Yeah. And I don't want to put Dr. Jim out of business. No, I wouldn't. He's got plenty to do. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, happy Monday.